Before we begin, I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Olitsky, our Chief Medical Officer and a member of the Foundation's Board of Directors. Scott is part of a family with known HHT going back five generations. He obtained his medical degree from Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia and then completed a residency in ophthalmology, a fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology, and later obtained an MBA from the Block School of Business. Tonight, Dr. Olitsky will answer your questions about HHT and anemia. I now pass tonight's program over to Scott. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm excited to uh, talk about, I think, a very common issue that we all face uh, and one that sometimes is either underdiagnosed or, or undertreated. So uh, anemia and HHC is probably one of the more common problems that are faced by uh, the HHC community. And as I mentioned, it's often undertreated. And unfortunately, I think uh, for many HHT patients, we are taught either um, by other people living with the disease or unfortunately uh, by uh, physicians who are treating us that we need to uh, somehow uh, accept that we're going to live with some level of anemia. And I think with modern day approaches that uh, should be uh, less likely and less desirable for most, most patients. Um, anemia can uh, not only affect your daily quality of life, but it can also worsen some of the other manifestations of HHT. Uh, for example, patients with increased cardiac output due to liver AVMs, for example, uh, those patients uh, may have an uh, additional increase in their uh, cardiac output or the amount of work their heart needs uh, to produce because they're anemic and uh, they can see significant improvement perhaps by uh, increasing their hemoglobin to normal levels. Some studies have shown that about 50% of HHT patients are anemic. Um, that, I think, is probably uh, uh, a, a low number. That comes from patients mainly who are being seen at uh, HHT centers, so they're probably patients who are already uh, having some uh, issue or at least know to be checking for their uh, anemia and other complications of HHT, so it's probably I think it's safe to say it's uh, significantly higher than 50% of patients with HHT will be anemic at some point during their life. Importance of hemoglobin when talking about anemia. Uh, hemoglobin is a protein that lives within our red blood cells, or RBCs, and it helps to carry oxygen to the rest of the body. And it's made up of uh, several components you can see in the uh, picture uh, down below here. So uh, heme is uh, a, a protein molecule which has uh, s uh, several components to it, including the iron component. Uh, um, and then it's attached to the uh, protein that hemoglo uh, to form hemoglobin, which lives within the red blood cell or the erythrocyte, uh, which then is used to uh, bring oxygenated blood to the rest of our body and then carry deoxygenated blood back to the lungs to become oxygenated again. Uh, before returning to the heart and making another trip around the body. Okay. So iron is an important uh, component of, uh, uh, of this whole process. So iron is used in hemoglobin. It's uh, used uh, in some of the proteins in our muscle. It's used in a number of other proteins uh, throughout the body. But most of the iron in our body is in the form of hemoglobin, and some iron is stored in other places of the body, uh, most notably the bone marrow, the liver, and the spleen. In terms of regulating iron, uh, our bodies cannot produce iron. We must get it from our diet, so it's the only source we have uh, other than some of the treatments we may talk about in, in, in just a little bit. Uh, and there's no rec mechanism to get rid of iron in, in, in order to regulate it. So really the only method we have to regulate how much iron our body has is through adjusting the absorption of iron that we take. Uh, so we, we as HHT patients know about the danger and the significance of having too little iron or too little hemoglobin, but having an overload of iron, which can occur in certain disease states, uh, can also be equally dangerous. Uh, 
that that's not something most of us face, obviously, uh, although uh, although some patients may uh, actually with uh, pulmonary ABMs who end up uh, uh, developing a, a hyper level of uh, hemoglobin uh, in their blood. So this is this is kind of a busy slide. Uh, I just wanted to show um, where uh, iron is taken in and where it's stored. And at the top, you can see where it says uh, duodenal enterocytes. That's the inner layer of your small intestine. So you take uh, iron in through uh, uh, through your diet. It uh, is absorbed through the small intestine, and then you can see it's brought into various areas of the body, the muscle. Uh, the bone marrow, uh, macrophages, which are cells that are also uh, in your blood. Uh, of course, the main uh, main portion of the iron lives inside the red blood cells and also the liver. But what I wanted to uh, highlight here, if you can move to the next uh, slide, uh, Nicole, is uh, that molecule right there, hepcidin. Hepcidin is a protein that is made by the liver, and uh, this is relatively new information. Hepcidin and the role of hepcidin in iron uh, regulation was only recently uh, uh, discovered within the last 20 years or so. Um, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But hepcidin is an important regulator of iron uh, metabolism. And if you can go on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about hepcidin. So hepcidin is a protein that's produced in the liver. It is a major regulator of iron absorption. It blocks absorption uh, of iron from the intestines. And, and remember that because we're gonna come back to that in a little bit when we talk about taking iron. Uh, hepcidin levels tend to increase during the day into the night and then drop back down in the morning. And that's also going to be important when we talk about uh, taking iron supplements. The levels also of hepcidin increase uh, for about 48 hours uh, after taking um, an iron supplement. Uh, again, that's going to be important when we talk about uh, iron supplementation. So if you can move, uh, if you can move on to the next. Uh, so right there, uh, where the circle is, shows again the inner lining of the intestine towards the left, and there's a protein called ferroprotein which uh, transports the iron from the intestines, and hepcidin blocks that. So the important thing to note here is that when hepcidin levels are high, when the protein is is high it blocks iron from coming in from the intestine. So, and when the levels are low, iron is more e easily absorbed from the intestine. And that's gonna be, again, an important point uh, that we wanna talk about when we get to, to diet and iron supplementation. So remember, high hepcidin, low absorption, lower hepcidin, higher absorption of dietary iron, okay? In terms of dietary iron, we uh, typically talk of two types of iron, uh, which you may have heard about. Uh, one is heme iron, and the other is non-heme iron. So heme iron is found in animal products. It's well absorbed through our intestines, uh, and its absorption is not affected by things like dairy products uh, or the products in tea or coffee. Again, this is gonna be important when we talk about uh, oral supplementation. So uh, heme iron is well, again, well absorbed, comes from animal products. Uh, not, the absorption is not affected by some of these other compounds, okay? Non-heme iron is, are, is found in plant-based products. It's not as well absorbed. Uh, vitamin C can help the absorption of non-heme iron, and its, its absorption, unlike the heme form, is decreased by uh, dairy and the products that you might find in tea or coffee. And I thought this was an interesting diagram because it shows, uh, and you can find many of these on the internet, but it shows uh, the, some of the relationships between the source of iron, the absorption, and how much iron is available. So at the bottom, you can see organ meats are very high in, uh, in iron, such as chicken liver, beef liver. Um, there are plant-based uh, products that are fairly high in iron, but they're not absorbed very well. So if you look at the diagram on the left, you can see how much iron is available. 
But more importantly, you have to look at the diagram on the right, and you can see that many of the plant-based uh, sources of iron, although they may have a fair amount of uh, iron in them, they're not absorbed as well. So that's why uh, even lower doses of heme iron uh, may actually be better uh, or more beneficial because you'll actually absorb more of the uh, iron that's available in the, in the food that you're eating. Okay. So when we're talking about anemia and HHT, by and large, we're talking about iron deficiency anemia, the, the form of anemia that occurs uh, because there's not enough iron to help our body produce hemoglobin and the red blood cells. Worldwide, the most common cause is dietary uh, insufficiency. So, so by far, the vast majority of people around the world who have iron deficiency anemia uh, have that because of their uh, diet and the lack of iron that they take in through their diet. However, in HHT, it's not surprising that the main cause uh, for iron deficiency anemia is loss of iron through chronic blood loss, usually uh, either uh, because of nosebleeds or GI bleeding. Uh, unfortunately, I'm sure many of us uh, uh, listening to this probably are well aware of the symptoms of iron deficiency anemia, fatigue, insomnia, restless legs, exercise intolerance. You, you, you try and go out for a run or do some exercising and uh, you can't do as well as you, as you used to or uh, as well as you do when your hemoglobin is at better levels, shortness of breath, uh, irritability, poor concentration, and pica. Pica is, is the term for the description when uh, people with iron deficiency anemia, anemia crave things like ice or clay. Um, sometimes uh, in children we'll see uh, eating uh, dirt, uh, which is a form of pica as well. So the signs of uh, iron deficiency anemia, pale skin, pale mucous membranes, uh, conjunctiva uh, uh, or inside of your mouth, your mouth may be dry, uh, hair loss uh, is common uh, when it's chronic, uh, as is brittle fingernails, some of the signs. Diagnosing uh, iron deficiency anemia clinical exam may give some hints to that, but by and large, uh, the diagnosis is made through laboratory testing. And these are the studies that most uh, physicians will order when either looking for iron deficiency anemia or following um, the results of your treatment or seeing what your status is, a complete blood count or a CBC, uh, looking at iron studies and also looking at ferritin levels. A CBC or complete blood count uh, it has many components to it, but the three that are usually uh, most critical, looking at hemoglobin levels, uh, looking at hematocrit level, a hematocrit just tells the percentage of the blood that uh, your red blood cells uh, take up, and also looking at something called mean corpuscular volume or MCV, and that, that's looking at the size of the, uh, the average size of your red blood cells. And in iron deficiency anemia, you tend to see small blood cells, not only less blood, red blood cells, but smaller ones. So we call this microcystic uh, uh, anemia. And uh, I'm sorry, microcystic anemia. And the blood cells are smaller than they should be. Um, in terms of iron studies, uh, physicians will uh, typically order a total serum iron to look at the level of iron in your blood. Uh, in iron deficiency anemia, this is going to be lower. Transferrin, which is a protein that transports iron around in the body. Uh, one of the ways your, your body tries to compensate is by increasing this. So you typically have higher levels of transferrin if you uh, have iron deficiency anemia. And uh, total iron binding compa capacity, or TIBC, uh, which tells us how much transferrin is available to bind in, uh, to the iron in your body. So if you have a low amount of iron, the TIBC is going to be higher, meaning that there's more capacity for iron to bind. Uh, ferritin is a protein that helps store uh, iron in our body. Think of it as uh, essentially the storage unit uh, for iron. Uh, however, ferritin is what we call an acute phase reactant. Um, which means it can be elevated in certain disease states uh, if, there's, if, you're, if there's inflammation in your body, perhaps after a recent infection, if you have 
another uh, uh, another disease process which causes inflammation. So there are times where the ferritin can be falsely elevated, uh, let's say after uh, having a recent cold, where it may not really indicate what your your iron stores are. So it's important to take your, fer uh, your ferritin levels into account and look at those in relation to some of the other testing, because there may be times where your, where your iron stores are low but your ferritin may be normal or high and that may not be because you have uh, a, a normal amount of iron stored it may be that there's some other process going on to elevate your ferritin so a low ferritin is important a normal or high ferritin may or may not be important depending on what the other studies show and, and, and these have to be taken into uh, consideration. So just getting a ferritin level, for example, may not really tell you what your iron status is. Two basic ways of treating iron deficiency anemia, uh, at least in HHT patients, uh, decreasing your iron or blood loss or increasing your iron intake. So stopping or slowing blood loss is uh, obviously something we, we would all like to see, and um, that's a topic, uh, a large topic for another time, but uh, we know that there are certain medications and uh, procedures that can help uh, with that, and fortunately, we're, we're seeing uh, new procedures and new medications come online that will hopefully help us with this, but the, really I, what I want to talk about is increasing the intake of iron. So you can increase your iron intake either through your diet, through oral supplements, or through IV supplementation. I think this statement's important to remember for HHT patients. It is almost impossible, and some people might say impossible, to make up for significant iron deficiency due to blood loss by increasing dietary iron intake. I, uh, many people ask, you know, what can I do to my diet to uh, get my iron levels back to normal? For many people, especially if there's active bleeding, it, it probably isn't realistic that you're going to change your diet enough uh, to increase your iron uh, levels in your iron stores to a normal level. Oral iron uh, is a good first step for many patients. Most of the oral iron supplements that we see are non-heme based. Uh, unfortunately, side effects can limit their many people and uh, side effects uh, may include eye upset, constipation, uh, indigestion, heartburn. So it's estimated that up to 70% of people will have some side effect. A significant percentage of people who try to take uh, iron orally won't be able to tolerate it and won't be able to elevate their iron levels uh, sufficiently, sufficiently uh, that, through that route. This is a list of some of the oral iron products. Um, really too many to talk about today. I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, in the middle, you'll see a, a, a dose and an elemental iron dose. The elemental iron dose is that you're actually uh, uh, using to elevate your, your uh, iron levels. Um, it is safe to say that the more you increase the elemental iron in the compound or by taking it more frequently or larger doses, the more likely you are to have side effects. So, so the side effects are almost directly related to the amount of elemental iron you're, you're attempting to ingest. Um, and some studies have shown that once you increase uh, the level that you're taking, uh, to a certain degree, the only thing you're probably going to do is increase uh, either the risk of side effects or the extent of the side effects, and you're not going to increase how much iron you're actually able to absorb. I do want to point out at the bottom, uh, uh, all of these are, are non-heme-based products, uh, except for the last one, which is Proferrin ES, and you'll see it's a much smaller dose of elemental iron, but it's a heme iron product. So remember back to that graph, uh, although it has less iron available in, in the pill itself, it's actually much better absorbed. 
And this is Proferrin ES. I, I personally like this product a lot uh, for two reasons. It is very well tolerated. It doesn't have the side effects that the uh, non-heme iron has. Uh, so a lot of people who can't tolerate non, the non-heme iron can tolerate this quite well. Uh, it does not have to be taken on an empty stomach and away from some of the other foods we're going to talk about. Um, so if you're having a lot of side effects with the uh, non-heme iron, uh, one approach is to decrease how much you're taking if you're attempting to take too much of it. Another might be to use something like this product, Proferrin, which has less side effects. And you can also, uh, you also have to uh, worry less about how you're taking it and what other foods you're taking it with. This is an important, uh, I think, uh, issue for people taking oral iron, how to take it properly. So if you're taking uh, non-heme uh, non iron, which uh, again is the vast majority of the preparations that, that you see, uh, you need to take it on an empty stomach, which uh, generally means one hour before a meal or two hours after. You want to avoid uh, dairy, coffee, tea, or antacids. These all decrease the absorption of, of non-heme uh, iron components. Uh, some of us are taking doxycycline for the treatment of uh, nosebleeds. You want to avoid uh, taking your doxycycline for about two hours on either side of your iron. Vitamin C can help with the absorption of non-heme iron products, so uh, not a bad idea to take it with some vitamin C or a glass of orange juice. Uh, remember uh, what I uh, mentioned about the protein hepcidin. Remember when hepcidin levels are lower, uh, you absorb iron better from your intestine. So it's recommended that you take your iron first thing in the morning because hepcidin levels are lower and the absorption of your iron, iron is going to be higher. Um, so a couple of things in terms of hepcidin, you probably want to take it in the morning. Uh, sometimes I see people are taking it multiple times during the day. When you take a dose of oral iron, it increases your hepcidin levels, remember, for about 24 to 48 hours. So if you're taking it in the morning, then you're taking it again in the afternoon, you're probably not absorbing, the, absorbing uh, as much in the afternoon. Now, if you need to do that because you can't tolerate uh, the dose, you know, a, a larger dose in the morning, it may be better to get some absorption in the afternoon, uh, even though you're not going to be getting uh, a maximum absorption. And taking it at night before bedtime, some people I know like to do that because they avoid some of the side effects. Again, if that allows you to continue taking your oral iron, that may not be a bad approach. But if you can take it, if you don't have to take it at night, uh, it's best not to because your hepcidin levels are higher at night and you're going to absorb it less. Um, remember after, I just said, remember uh, after taking uh, oral iron, your hepcidin levels are uh, high for about 24 to 48 hours. So some studies have shown the best approach is to take your uh, oral iron not every day, but every other day. If you take it in the morning on the first day, your hepcidin levels go up for 24 to 48 hours, they go back down, and then you take it uh, 48 hours later and you're more likely to absorb more of it. Uh, and, and there have been some studies that have shown that taking it that way uh, does uh, increase your, your serum iron levels better than taking it every day. Um, those studies were done in iron deficient pregnant women. So we don't know if that translates to the general population as well, but a lot of hematologists will talk about taking oral iron every other day. Uh, IV iron is, um, so, is certainly something we're seeing many patients get, uh, especially those who can't uh, tolerate oral iron. It's probably safe to say that uh, if your iron levels are significantly low, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get them uh, uh, higher, especially if you're actively bleeding. Uh, through the use of oral iron. Fortunately, the modern preparations of IV iron are very safe and effective. Side effects uh, do occur. Uh, generally, they're minor. Uh, the serious and even life-threatening um, side effects, unfortunately, are very, very rare. The different preparations vary by how much iron they deliver and how it's given. So again, this is a pretty busy table. I'm not going to go through all of this, but just to give you an idea of the different types of IV iron, I'll point out a couple of uh, um, preparations here. Um, 
The second one down you can see is venifer. I know a lot of patients probably get venifer. That's a very popular uh, compound. Um, the downside to venifer, it's very safe. Uh, it, do, it doesn't take very long to give. The downside is you can see it only delivers about 200 milligrams. And most of the time we're talking about trying to give somebody close to 1,000 milligrams or a gram of iron uh, with each treatment. So you, uh, to get uh, really what many people call a full dose, uh, takes five consecutive treatments, uh, which can be given over five days or a number of days. But to get uh, a significant dose of iron, you have to go back uh, multiple times to get infused. Uh, the top one there is, is Infed. Um, uh, Infed can be given uh, a very large dose. You can replete most or all of your um, iron uh, needs in, in one uh, dose. The downside is that it typically takes a, a large amount of time. It may take several hours uh, to give the dose completely. And um, the risk of side effects, although not uh, generally not severe, but, uh, but some side effects are a little bit higher with Enfed than some of the other uh, products. Um, the fourth one down is Ferrahim. Ferrahim has become a, a popular um, uh, IV iron product. It's uh, 510 milligrams per dose. It's usually given as two doses separated uh, uh, three to eight days apart. It's very effective, very well tolerated, can be given, um, it says less than one minute, but that's not how it's given in most infusion places. Um, it can be usually be given in uh, over 15 minutes, so it's rapid. Um, although it is the label, it is labeled as uh, being given uh, in two doses over three to eight, uh, day, uh, three to eight days apart. Um, there are a number of studies that show that both doses can be safely given at one time. Um, unfortunately, because the package is not labeled that way, many infusion centers won't do it, although there, this has been extensively written about. Uh, it's, it's something worth asking your hematologist about uh, because uh, some centers some infusion centers will uh, allow it to be given as a single, both doses as a single dose, uh, obviously much more convenient. And for the insurance companies, uh, they, they end up paying less because they don't have to pay for two infusions. So um, some insurance companies are, are uh, happy to pay for that if the infusion center will, will allow it to be done. Uh, underneath there, Injectifer, which is also uh, um, fairly commonly used. I, do, I did want to point out, uh, and you can go on to the next slide, um, the, one of the issues with Injectifer is it can cause a reduction in serum phosphate levels, which are, are hypophosphatemia, which can affect the strength of your bones. So this is something that needs to be watched very closely. And uh, I think many hematologists uh, prefer to stay away from Injectifer if you're going to be getting IV iron um, you know, in multiple doses or on a continuing basis. Uh, I think this needs to be pointed out because there's a lot of confusion, especially among uh, some physicians, uh, hopefully not among our HHT physicians, but among a lot of uh, physicians when treating anemia. So the treatment of iron deficiency without anemia is very important. Many of us may not be frankly anemic, but we are iron deficient. So remember, ferritin is the storage vehicle for iron. So if you have less iron store or your ferritin is low, it means you have, you have less uh, iron available to make blood if you have a significant nosebleed. So you may be chugging along just, just fine with a hemoglobin of uh, 13 or 14, but if you have a significant hemorrhage and you don't have the iron stores or your ferritin levels are not uh, where they need to be, uh, that could put you into an anemic uh, state. In addition, symptoms of iron deficiency without anemia are very much like those of anemia. Um, so you, even though you may not be frankly anemic, you can feel just as rotten um, uh, and have many of the same symptoms because your iron levels are low, even though your hemoglobin levels are okay. Uh, sleep experts have uh, tied, uh, have associated low ferritin levels to sleep disturbances. Uh, so low iron can lead to uh, restless leg syndrome, but it can also lead to sleep disturbances um, in by itself. So unfortunately, we hear a lot of uh, people 
not getting their iron repleted when it should be uh, because they're not uh, they're not found to be anemic even though their iron stores. So just checking the hemoglobin is not sufficient as an HHC patient. So when is it time to move beyond IV iron? Um, well, really when you can't replace it well enough to maintain an acceptable hemoglobin, to uh, maintain an acceptable hemoglobin level. So if you're getting frequent iron and your hemoglobin is not moving up, uh, you probably need to be looking at doing something else, whether that's a procedure for your epistaxis, whether it's other medications to try and decrease GI bleeding or, or nosebleeds. Um, and then uh, people would argue that if you're, uh, even if you're able to maintain your levels, but the frequency with which you need to get infused with iron is, is becoming too great, that, that's another opportunity to, and another reason to look at the use of uh, uh, other treatment uh, protocols to to limit how much you're bleeding so you don't have to receive as much iron. So in summary, we'll talk about the following things. You can hit next. So anemia is very common in HHC. It's very hard, and some people might say uh, impossible, to make up for loss of iron uh, just by changing or uh, improving your diet, especially if you are constantly bleeding. Oral iron supplementation is a good step. Uh, considering, consider the following. Take it on an empty stomach, especially if you're taking a non-heme product. Take a single dose. Take it in the morning. If your side effects limit uh, your ability to take the iron, try a different formulation. Consider uh, something like a heme-based product like proferrin. Consider every other day dosing, uh, which may be more effective. IV iron is safe and effective and should be utilized uh, when needed. Uh, and then, of course, combine these strategies with other strategies to reduce bleeding uh, when, whenever possible. And if iron, IV iron is not working or the need is too great, consider other options to stop active bleeding. Um, you may have seen some social media posts and emails. Uh, this is an exciting product I just wanted to mention. We sent out a survey. We had a very nice response to it. Uh, Cure HHT is partnering with Sanguina, which is looking at a uh, smartphone app to measure your hemoglobin. Uh, we are in the process of um, collating through the survey and uh, inviting some people to beta test the product. We're really excited about this and we're very grateful for everybody's help who answered the survey and hopefully we'll have a, more information about this uh, shortly. And that's our talk and I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, again, sorry for the uh, bandwidth issue, but I think we made it through okay. Great. Thank you so much. Scott, I appreciate it. And for everybody hanging in there with us, we've had some storms here in Maryland that um, has been messing with our internet as well. So um, again, just thank you for your patience. And so we will go over a little bit past eight o'clock since we did start late and had some technical difficulties and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, so let's see here. We'll start with a question that came in to us um, um, ahead of time um, from Boynton Beach, Florida. And the question actually is, what are the side effects of hypophos, well, in patients receiving frequent um, nosebleeds? I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit there, Nicole. Symptoms of what? What are the side effects of hypophosphatemia in oh. patients receiving frequent iron infusion? So um, one of the most common, uh, there, there's a number of them, but one of the most common ones is your, your bones. Um, uh, phosphate levels are very important to uh, the stability of your bones. And we have seen uh, and heard from patients who've had compression fractures in their spine or elsewhere. Uh, due to softening of their bones from hypophosphatemia. So it's not that this product can't be used, although I think many people try to stay away from it, especially 
uh, for those patients who are getting frequent uh, iron infusions, but um, hopefully most physicians know to be checking your phosphate levels uh, to, to make sure that this is not uh, happening to you. I think the reported incidence that I've seen range, there's a range, but somewhere around 50%. So it's a, it's a significant uh, potential problem and, and it occurs in a not insignificant percentage of people. Great, thank you. So we have a question from Renee who's on tonight asking um, just the basics of why do you have anemia if you eat correctly? Which I know you went through in your slides, but if you could just give a brief overview of why just diet alone doesn't, doesn't work, particularly for HHP. Well, um, for most of us, I mean, it's because we're bleeding. We're actively bleeding from somewhere. And it doesn't take a whole lot of blood loss um, that's chronic, that's happening every single day. And uh, that may be nosebleeds. Uh, it, could also be, um, it could also be GI bleeding. So you know, if you have uh, uh, telangiectasia in your intestines that are just slowly bleeding, not enough to even really be uh, noticeable, but you know, every single day you're, you're losing a fair amount of blood um, and it's hard to catch up. And of course, uh, 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 women uh, um, are going to have an even more difficult time because a large percentage of women are iron deficient anyway um, because of menstruation. So uh, if, you're an, if you're a woman with HHT, you, you've really got two issues that, uh, that that could cause you to lose iron. Okay, fantastic. So the next question is from John, who's on with us tonight, and says, does oral iron increase nosebleeds? Yeah, that's a good question. That was recently, I, I saw something on social media. Uh, there was a study that showed that an abrupt increase in iron, uh, whether it's uh, oral iron or IV iron, uh, do, uh, does lead in some patients to an increase in your nose in nosebleeds. Um, report the study that uh, looked at that. It was about five percent uh, of patients that start taking oral iron will experience that, uh, and about seven percent of patients with IV iron. So uh, it's not unusual uh, for patients, let's say, to start oral iron or again the dose of IV iron and their nosebleeds are worse for a little while. It tends to level itself off. It, it tends not to be a chronic issue, but it happens when your iron abruptly goes up from uh, one of those uh, supplementation protocols. Uh, and it's thought that the iron irritates the cells that line the inside wall of the blood vessel, and this is what causes that bleeding. But it, it's definitely a reported uh, uh, side effect, um, but fortunately for most patients, short-lived. Okay, fantastic. Um, our next question um, comes also from someone on tonight. Um, Marla's asking, um, she has PAEM, and her HHT doctor says that she needs a point to micron inline IV filter. Her Kaiser doctor says they can't provide one. So she's asking if she should get one in mind. Does she need to have a license to pur purchase that? What should she do? Yeah, certainly if she has PAVM, she should be using one. Um, I don't have uh, a, a, an answer in, uh, off the top of my head. I, I've certainly dealt with this issue uh, myself. Um, and it usually, usually there's a filter somewhere in these hospitals. And uh, what I found is at times there's a resistance because it takes an extra effort, but they have to have these available for certain patients and they're also used for certain medications. So they have to be available somewhere and um, maybe, maybe we can uh, work with uh, her to get her some more information to bring her doctors. Okay, thank you. We'll make note of that. Um, we have a question that came in um, from Sam uh, prior to the, to the webinar asking what test is recommended to check anemia and blood iron levels, CBC only or CBC and serum iron, um, and how often should those tests be taken? Uh, so I, I think it's safe to say that these uh, all all of what I mentioned should be ordered. I don't think most physicians treating iron deficiency anemia would be comfortable just checking, certainly not just checking the hemoglobin. 
because as I mentioned, uh, iron deficiency is a significant problem even if you're not anemic. So you need to be checking, uh, so, uh, you need to be checking those other values. Um, if you're checking, so you need to check the CBC. Uh, if you're only checking your ferritin, it can be falsely elevated, as I mentioned. Uh, so uh, checking the ferritin alone really isn't helpful. You, you really need all three of those, uh, those laboratory tests, the CBC, uh, the iron studies, and the ferritin to get a complete picture. How often that should be done, uh, it really depends, I think, on what your um, what the state is of your hemoglobin, your iron, uh, if you're bleeding. So there are some patients who really don't have any problem in checking once a year is probably sufficient. There are other people who need to be checking much more frequently every month or even more frequently than that. Okay, thank you. So Judith from Iowa has asked, is it possible to have anemia even if nosebleeds aren't a big problem? Certainly. Uh, so anybody can have iron deficiency anemia. And uh, as I mentioned, a significant num uh, percentage of females uh, are, have iron deficiency anemia, even if they don't have HHT. And of course, remember, uh, you may or may not know if you have uh, uh, GI bleeding. So you could be losing a significant amount of blood from uh, GI bleeding, even if you never have a nosebleed. Okay. Um, and one other, one other thing I'll mention is um, there are other causes of anemia other than diet and HHT. So there, there are other disease states which lead to iron deficiency anemia. So uh, remember two things. Just because you have HHT doesn't mean that you um, uh, can't have something else going on. And if you're not responding, uh, it, it may not be just the HHT that's, a, that's an issue. Okay, so we have a question actually coming in from London, um, and it, um, she is um, 18 weeks pregnant and um, really struggling with anemia and wondering if it's dangerous, um, you know, to be on any of these iron supplements or doing anything to raise her iron levels. Um, she's trying to use diet, um, but just really struggling and wondering if you have any advice. So uh, there was uh, recently an article written by uh, some some of the people who are really well known in uh, the treatment of iron deficiency anemia. And this was this was a topic that they all weighed in on, and they were all, I, I think, had a very strong opinion about. So many uh, pregnant women are iron deficient uh, in general, um, and that is a situation that absolutely needs to be treated. And IV iron is probably underutilized and should be utilized to a much greater extent for, for pregnant women who are iron deficient, uh, not just for them, but also for the developing fetus. And iron deficiency in neonates is, can be a significant issue. Uh, and it's been linked to uh, uh, early cognitive uh, issues. Um, so it absolutely needs to be treated, and IV iron is a is a uh, an effective uh, and useful way of treating it. Okay, great, thank you, um, Scott. Are you familiar at all with um, insurance costs and various um, pricing differences, possibly from different locations of getting an infusion? Um, for example, a cancer clinic versus a, an infusion? Yes, but there can be a wide ver uh, variability. I've seen that in uh, pricing among uh, some of the people I've spoken to. And it can be hundreds of dollars for one and thousands of dollars for other places. And, and that's um, many times, many, and, and sometimes obviously that cost is passed down to the patient in terms of you know, what their copay is or if they have a deductible. So your insurance company will often help you find uh, a place that may be more reasonable uh, or cheaper uh, to get the exact same product. And, and obviously they're happy to do that because they save a lot of money uh, by doing it, but it uh, also saves the patient as well. There's a lot of variability, obviously, with heard a lot about uh, price transparency in medicine, and unfortunately, we're not there yet. So you can get a pretty surprising bill for exactly the same thing being given uh, at a location. Generally, hospitals are going to be much more expensive. 
Okay. And that is what this person is saying is that they had seen a differential of $600 at a cancer clinic versus $5,000 at an institution center. So um, the best advice would be to ask up front what the cost is and if it's covered by your insurance, I would think. And yes. as you said, to ask Talk your to doctor direction. Yeah, and insurance companies are not surprisingly happy to help you find some place where they uh, where it would be less expensive. Okay, is there a difference um, between um, with absorption with uh, liquid iron supplement versus tablets? Uh, I think that some people believe that the uh, liquid probably may be higher. Uh, again, a lot of it comes down to how much elemental iron there is and how much you can tolerate. So, um, and and, there, and what this specific formulation is. So there are too many products really that get into uh, an, an individual product, but um, the amount of elemental iron, whether or not you're gonna be able to tolerate it, uh, the form of iron that's in it, and um, and it may be liquid versus uh, pill form as well. So liquid is not necessarily more easily absorbed. It just depends on what's in the product. Correct. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, we have so many questions coming in. I'm taking a peek here um, do you have um, any results um, for treatment of a vastin as an option for um, stopping nosebleeds and helping with anemia well, there was a survey that was published, uh, an international survey, um, looking at a number of uh, at a number of different centers, uh, and it showed a significant benefit for a large number of people uh, in terms of the decreased need for blood transfusions and iron infusions. Uh, for both epistaxis, nosebleeds, as well as GI bleeding. So. Um, Avastin would, would certainly be a reasonable option to talk to your physician about if either you, you can't um, you can't keep the, the iron you're getting is not maintaining your hemoglobin or you have to get it so frequently that it, it, it really becomes uh, an issue with your quality of life. Okay, thank you. So we have someone on tonight um, that uh, in addition to HHT, has celiacs and wondering if that will affect their iron absorption. Are you familiar with that? You know, I'm not uh, familiar enough with celiac uh, disease uh, and its effect on iron absorption to, to be able to uh, answer that well, I think. Okay, that's fine. Um, we would just recommend that they contact an HHT center if they're not already affiliated and go through that screening process, because I think um, as always an HHT center is your best resource. And um, you know, once you are a patient of record, then the HHT physician can also work with your local physicians if you have questions like that. So we're always encouraging people. Um, and if you're not sure which HHT center is nearest you, um, give our office a call Monday through Friday. Um, or go on our website and we'd be happy to help you. Um, let's see. Um, could you explain um, what the future looks like um, to control bleeding? Um, so that patients with HHT can reduce GI and nosebleed? Well, um, as one one person just asked, uh, Avastin or Bevacizumab has certainly been a game changer for many patients. Um, uh, as I think we talked about in the previous webinar, the path taking at pomalidomide um, is, is uh, also a, a you know a, a we're hoping will show positive results. Um, Pazopinib uh, is uh, is a product that can be taken 
uh, with, that, that has shown some promise in uh, a small number of patients. It needs to be studied more, but it's certainly shown some promise, and we, we hope to have a study looking at pisopidinib in the not-too-distant future. And then there are uh, many uh, uh, other products that I think may show some benefit um, that are that are available in the oncology world, similar to what happened with bevacizumab, but targeting different uh, pathways, which probably are going to uh, turn out to be helpful as well. So I, I think there's a, a fair number of products that we hopefully will be looking at. Um, you know, the, the problem, of course, is funding these uh, studies. It, uh, these aren't cheap and and uh, Get, uh, getting the resources available to do proper studies is sometimes challenging. Right. Um, and so I have um, Becky, who's on with us tonight, asking, um, would an HHT patient with normal hemoglobin level, lower ferritin and low iron level be considered iron deficient um, because uh, she's finding most hematologists find this normal because the hemoglobin level is normal, even though they're symptomatic for anemia. Yeah, so I, I think our HHT hematologist would say absolutely that patient's iron deficient and needs uh, uh, to have it replenished, whether that's by oral iron or uh, if that's not possible or it's not working, IV iron. But that patient, yeah, that somebody with a normal hemoglobin and low iron needs attention. And I would say if if uh, some if a physician doesn't agree with that, probably uh, need to look for somebody who would view that differently. Okay. And again, possibly reaching out to an HHT center for that um, intervention. So yes. I have um, an individual who sent in a question um, prior to tonight um, asking that is even light exercise recommended if their hemoglobin is low, meaning less than nine, and they're fatigued? You know, um, that is something that certainly it needs to be discussed with uh, that person's physician. A lot of it will depend on uh, if their health, you know, what their health is. You know, certainly somebody with heart disease, that might not be something that their physician will want them doing until their hemoglobin is improved. And otherwise, a healthy person, uh, that may be perfectly fine as long as they don't push themselves to the point where, you know, they think they're, you know, uh, they're, they're going to hurt themselves and you know, they become too short of breath or their pulse rate becomes too high. Um, but for a healthy person, probably, Probably some exercise is certainly is certainly fine, but uh, it, it really depends on uh, on the person's general health, other than being anemic. Okay. Um, also, a question um, that was sent in ahead of time: um, This person has been getting IV infused iron uh, for years, and their iron scores are still chronically low. Um, any suggestions on ways to increase those levels or what their next steps should be? Well, um, I think there are two things that need to be looked at. Uh, where is this person losing blood, assuming they are? Uh, and can that be helped? For instance, could uh, if they're having significant nosebleeds, is there a way to uh, slow uh, or limit the amount of bleeding they have? And the other is looking at how aggressive their uh, their IV treatment is. As I mentioned, you know, I, I hear some patients getting uh, a dose of Enifer every other month. Well, that's 200 milligrams every other month. That that's pretty tough to compare to, um, you know, getting a full dose of Ferrahim every, every month, a thousand milligrams a month. So maybe more aggressive treatment with the IV preparations would be helpful. And sometimes it's just a matter, uh, if, even if if your if your iron stores are low, being very aggressive about getting enough iron in to get you to a level um, that's acceptable. And, and you and it may be it may require that extra aggressive treatment. Uh, it is very hard to overload iron overload of uh, an HHD patient. So uh, uh, I, I don't know what this person's getting, but uh, it's certainly worth looking at those two things, limiting the bleeding, but also talking to their uh, physician about being uh, more aggressive about their iron uh, replenishment. 
great. Thank you very much. Um, so we have um, another question here that came in from Boynton Beach, Florida. Does folic acid help with slight anemia? So uh, folate deficiency uh, is it, it can be related to anemia, but uh, folate deficiency, first of all, you most of our folate is obtained through things like green leafy vegetables. Folate deficiency is, actually leads to a different type of anemia. Um, w remember I talked about the uh, red blood cells being too small uh, in, in iron deficiency anemia. It's the opposite in folate deficiency, deficient anemia where the uh, hemoglobin and the red blood cells can't mature normally, so they're too large. So there are two different mechanisms. You can certainly have folate deficiency anemia, um, but it's probably if you have if, uh, if if you are iron deficient, um, unless you have something else going on with folate deficiency, uh, you probably don't need those extra supplements. Again, there's nothing to say that you can't have two different processes happening at the same time. However. Okay. And then I think this will be um, our last question for the um, for the evening, um, because we have gone over. Um, but this is regarding Injectifer and just asking about um, if you've seen any or heard of any side effects regarding um, fractures. We have an individual who's experienced after several uh, doses of Injectifer have experienced compression fractures and general compression of the spine, and the doctor is attributing it to Injectifer. And so they're just wondering if we're familiar with that, if it can be reversed, and if there's any other types of iron that would be better to use that wouldn't have that type of effect. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, Injectifer has a known uh, potential side effect of hypophosphatemia. Um, and when your phosphate levels are low, you are prone to things like compression fractures. So it's certainly possible. And I would assume that uh, if the doctor is saying that uh, this was caused by the injectifer, that probably uh, they've checked uh, this person's phosphate levels and they are low. Uh, the phosphate levels can be reversed with oral supplementation. Um, and as I had mentioned, it, I've seen it quoted about 50% of patients who get inject get repeated injective for uh, infusions will uh, show some degree of hypophosphatemia. So it's something that uh, is known or should be known. Um, some people, some hematologists stay away from injective for completely. Others may still use it, but what but should be watching the phosphate levels when they're when they are. Okay. Very good. Well, we had a lot of great questions tonight, and I hope that everyone benefited um, from these responses. I know that I've learned a lot tonight. Um, and so we just, um, on behalf of everyone here at HHT, we want to thank you all for joining us tonight for this virtual meetup and for staying connected with us. And uh, here at HHT is the only patient advocacy organization in the world for HHT, and we are here for you. You can rely on us for answers to your questions, updates, and any kind of support that you need with COVID-19 and beyond. Um, you can reach us at our office Monday through Friday um, and online on our website 24-7. So Pure HHT shared goal is to advance one common hope, to give those affected by HHT a chance for a normal life. And our virtual meetups and webinar series are just one of many ways we accomplish our mission. We're grateful to the donors of Pure HHT for making this and all educational events possible. So please consider donating to Pure HHT to ensure we continue to offer high quality education for you and your families. And please don't forget to complete the short survey you'll receive after this webinar. Your input is critical to the development of future conversations. Again, I want to thank Dr. Scott Olitsky for his time tonight to lead this virtual meetup. We appreciate your um, understanding with our technical difficulties, and um, we hope that everyone has uh, a good rest of the evening. Thank you, and good night.